Hello, I'm Rupert Sheldrake. I'm here with Mark Vernon for another in our series of dialogues. Hi there, Rupert. Hi. Hi, Mark. Um, we talk to each other about things we're both interested in, and we hope that it will help you to think about these things and discuss them with your friends. Um, Mark, uh, we've both been reading David Bentley Hart's Substack um, emails. This is a, a kind of subscription service. He's my favorite philosopher at the moment. And um, in recent weeks, he's been discussing um, the question of Gnosticism, um, uh, the cults, the, the, its relationship to early Christianity, Gnostic sects, and so on. And one of the things that comes through in those is that the Gnostics believe that this world is dominated by um, evil gods or gods, and that we're under some kind of dark cloud of power, of uh, negative rulers. Um, and often Gnosticism is criticized for being world-denying, life-denying, flesh-denying, etc. Um, but he points out that this is actually a worldview that comes across quite clearly in the New Testament. St. Paul's letters talk about this world as being dominated by archons, A-R-C-H-O-N, archons, rulers, uh, which include angels, um, as it were, fallen angels that dominate not just this earth, but the planetary spheres around the earth. It's as if the entire earth is under the control of these powers. Um, that's one view. Then um, there's also the view that the rulers are the actual rulers of this world, in his case, the Roman Empire, um, or negative forces or archetypes, we could put in, in modern words. And one that strikes me as being an obvious um, ruler of the world, uh, not seeing the entire universe as fallen or the entire solar system as fallen, but merely uh, human society has fallen, is mammon. The uh, wor worship of money, the power of money. Um, it, mammon is one of the fallen angels. Milton describes him in Paradise Lost. Um, and he's obsessed with gold and money and the power of money. And it's pretty clear that the whole world we live in is dominated by mammon. And Donald Trump always struck me as being a perfect representative of mammon, obsessed with wealth, gold and money. Um, um, and we're all under the power of, of this force. Um, and in a recent um, article, David Bentley Hartz also said that we're dominated by the image of the machine. Mechanistic science gives us a whole view of the universe as a machine, and our lives are dominated by machines, computers, the internet, uh, financial systems, which are all mechanized and quantified. Um, and it's even more impersonal than mammon. But the idea is that we're dominated by fallen powers, negative powers, and uh, then in, in the Christian version, Christ offers a way out of this, uh, liberates us from these powers by breaking through them and rising above them. Now, you've been reading this series too. I wonder what you made of it. Yeah, well, I've really enjoyed it as well, um, partly because of how it prompts your imagination, kind of like you're saying, what you know, what are these archons? How do I actually know them today? And I think that Mammon and then the machine are very good examples. It reminds me, I think Milton says that the fallen angel Mammon only looks at the ground and that sort of terrestrial view um, or the reductive view even, you might say, they're looking to the smaller and the smaller. Um, you start to get a real sense of how that has gripped the modern imagination. Um, and similarly, the machine, because I think the fascinating thing about the machine, as Jeremy Nadler puts in his great book, In the Shadow of the Machine, is that there's a whole kind of consciousness that has to take root before you're prepared to organize your life around machines. You know, machines have existed for millennia in lots of different cultures. There were steam engines in the ancient world, for example, but no one thought 
to capitalize upon them in the way that happened in the industrial revolution so there's a, it's very deep this it's not just that machines happen to come along and we utilize them um, there's already as it were an archetype or an archon of the machine in our mind um, that then uh, draws us towards organizing the whole world around them um, so it's very powerful um, i also really liked it because of this business that you mentioned at the start there about how this sense was actually shared by the early christian writers right across the board um it's only latterly that we kind of look back and say the gnostics were somehow heretics and orthodoxy came sailing through the middle but this quite dualistic he talks about um idea that there's a definitely a fallen world um as well as the divine world um that's quite pervasive in the new testament which you get if you read it in the greek it's often ironed out in translations um but he's an Greek author, well, it's an Eastern Orthodox, and so they read it in the Greek. Um, and he says that that's why this, this cosmology um, of all sorts of different angels and archons and principalities and powers and so on, that ecology is quite alive in the Orthodox mind because it's so clear in the Greek of the New Testament. I mean, one, one reason I really liked it, apart from anything else, is my um, little thing about Plato um, and this this tendency, I think, is quite powerful in Western Christianity to blame Plato for dualism. And I don't I think that's wrong and that uh, it's actually it was very much in the Hellenistic mindset. And so Dave Benny Hart talks a lot about how Paul, for one, is quite clear that the flesh and blood, sarx in the Greek, um, doesn't mean somehow a sort of fallen aspect of our nature, um, but does literally mean um, our embodied side of ourselves the flesh in in the straightforward sense um, and as as St Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15 you know flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of heaven but then this leads to what what the difference is and the difference with what became orthodoxy is that that is felt to be redeemable by being made into a new spiritual body um, and the whole of creation too um, a new creation um, that is redeemable whereas what became the more Gnostic sects um, felt that no, um, Christ's work was to provide a path that just flees um, and leaves that all behind. Um, and that was what became the sort of the, the telling difference. Um, so I found that really helpful. Plus, um, one more thought um, before handing back to you, this idea that um, modern Gnosticism, as its word is used now, um, is really not the same as ancient Gnosticism. So sometimes it's said that, for example, the dream of uploading yourself onto a computer and so gaining immortality through the power of the singularity, um, which a lot of the ultra wealthy tech entrepreneurs are investing their money in, is said to be Gnostic. And David Bentley Hart's very clear that that is the worst kind of Gnostic nightmare for the ancient Gnostics, because it's precisely to trap yourself indefinitely in the machine, in the material world. Um, it's to do precisely the opposite of what they felt was required. So I thought that was a really helpful clarification too. And it's not just, it's not just a sort of nitty gritty detail, but it's about expanding your imagination to get to grips more with the predicament that we find ourselves in. Yes, yes, I, I admit I found it a really stimulating discussion and actually your take on it makes it more so because I hadn't seen some of those aspects. Um, I mean, the, 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 one of the things is the, the, the level at which the fallenness happens. I mean, in the, the extreme Gnostics see the entire universe as governed by a kind of fallen god, a demiurge who's demonic or... Um, uh, then so that's the whole lot is fallen. And then there are those that see just the earth and the sublunary sphere is fallen or the parts of the solar system. Then there are those that see the archetypes just human like mammon and and the machine, human made machines and uh, as, as that which is trapping us. Um, then there are some that see the flesh and our fleshly nature as that which traps us. Um, so, I mean, there is, it's obvious to everybody there's a lot wrong with the world. So I suppose um, theories of 
why things have gone wrong, um, every culture and every mythology has to have, uh, because it's clear that the ruling powers and now and then are not entirely beneficent. They're self-interested, um, and especially the ultra-rich, and as we read about every day in the newspapers now. Um, so I suppose one of the things is the, that it, the questions it raises is precisely how the saving power of Christ or the saving power of anything uh, can liberate us from this. Um, and one of the images in the New Testament that St. Paul's interested in is that Christ rises above the level of the angels, or uh, to put it in more general terms, St. Paul talks of many gods, there are many gods. The angels are sort of the many gods of the world, and some good and some not so good. Um, but the idea is that Christ rises to a level above all the angels and is therefore able to subjugate them, not just pro providing a kind of escape route for us, but actually a transformation of the powers of the world. And I suppose the coming of the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be the um, establishment of a new kind of order. Yeah, um, and... If I give a sort of psychological take on that, I don't mean to purely psychologize it, um, I say it's just all what's going on in the human psyche, but um, to connect it to the psychological side of life, which of course interests me, um, is that, you know, our, our minds can be full of all sorts of thoughts and impulses and instincts and so on, um, which in times gone by would have been very directly related to spirits and angels and entities round and about it was we were people felt themselves to be much more porous and so when you felt something or had a thought it was as likely to be caused by a presence external to you as just something going on inside you um, and therefore this idea that Christ um, the kind of the good creative beautiful principle that runs through the whole of creation, aligning with that um, as a kind of bedrock um, uh, that is both at the origin and at the end of all things. That's that again, I, I feel that becomes much more relatable um, because it's about acknowledging that, you know, you, sometimes maybe you have a quiet mind and um, sometimes maybe you have peak experiences. But for most of us, much of the time, this kind of melee of thoughts and experiences and feelings is going to be our most immediate sense. So being able to align more consciously with that which is um, contains all of that, is the creative source of all of that, which in Christianity would be called Christ, um, meaning um, the Logos, um, the, the goodwill of God, the good voice of God spoken um, out in creation. That 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 feels um, a really good way of working with this at a, at a personal level, um, you know. Um, and then the other thing is about death as well. That, that was something that came out very strongly for me in what Dave Benhart was saying, that um, in the New Testament, it's stressed time and time again that Christ conquers death. And David makes the point that death was around people's lives, arbitrary, random, sudden, violent, often death. Um, and so why wouldn't you feel the fallen nature of things very immediately like that? It wasn't some, you know, rather um, esoteric, perhaps notion like sin or something or um, kind of regrets. It was very tangible and, and, and solid, um, but that Christ gives a way of reconceiving the relationship between life and death and knowing that in your life too. So that was another sort of take on, 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 on the work of, of Christ that became so resonant for people as Christianity spread. Yes. Well, I mean, the, the death thing is, is, I suppose, I hadn't actually seen this as connected uh, to the bigger cosmic dimension before. Um, I mean, the, the death thing is more immediate in the sense that it, it seems that the, the belief is that through the death and resurrection of Christ, he's opened a way through which uh, the rest of us, through following his example and path, um, can survive 
in a different way. I mean, it's taken for granted that people survive in some form uh, of the survive bodily death in Hades or in Sheol or in a kind of shadowy realm, an underground realm. Um, Christ's uh, overcoming death is actually cosmicized, isn't it? Because he ascends into the heavens and there's a great deal about ascending into the heavens. And I suppose this echoes Egyptian views that the pharaohs after death went on a kind of celestial journey, the pyramids and all that technology of death in, in, and tombs and mummification and so on in Egypt was about them going on this after death journey to the heavens, something that they were headed for the belt of Orion or the dog star Sirius, that, that there were actual celestial destinations. And so the death and resurrection of Jesus and his ascension into heaven, it says in the creed, ascended, he ascended into heaven, um, meaning the sky, um, does give this kind of cosmic dimension to this. It's not just a personal afterlife, it's uh, connecting with the entire cosmos. And I suppose that this relates to the idea that the whole of creation comes forth from the one God and that um, there is this unification that's possible that brings things together in Christ through his resurrection. Um, and that this is, so it's just, it's, it's both resurrection, um, life after death, but in a way that takes us way beyond this worldly realm. I mean, it, it going into the heavens and the state of being in the life after death must go beyond a mere kind of purgatory type um, reliving of scenes from this life. And, and it must involve going into a completely different state of consciousness, which is much more cosmic. Um, I suppose that's implicit in, in the New Testament. I'm not sure. What do you think? Yeah, well, it's, it, these, these words like ascending, I think are so fascinating. I remember once hearing a sermon, I think it was, where the preacher made the remark that the account of the ascension in Luke um, doesn't actually necessarily imply he went up, um, but that he went into more. And so the idea that God's presence uh, appears like a cloud and that when it says Christ went into the clouds, um, therefore means that Christ became one with the divine presence. Um, and so it, it means um, that this is as much... Uh, um a spiritual perception as anything literal you know as if you know if you had a, a a mobile phone you could have filmed jesus going up into the sky you know i don't think that's what it implies at all it implies much more that much maybe like it was anticipated at the transfiguration when christ became radiant with effulgent light that was a foretaste of what happened at the at the ascension and and displays for us the origin um, and, you know, the ever-present origin, to use John Gebser's phrase, um, of our life, which is divine, um, but that gets occluded and lost and overlaid um, with um, that which the Gnostics and the early Christians, you know, were so aware of because of the fallen, deadly state of the world. Um, so that's how I, I see it as much as um, a revelation of the way the cosmos actually is, um, held in the divine life um, as much as well as at the same time being you know kind of our destiny that to which we're drawn and can know um, at least in some measure before death as much as we'll know after death as well um, and I kind of actually increasingly feel that this life is to become more and more aware of that dimension of reality so that when we die we're kind of ready for it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if rather than reviewing this life, um, the question will be how much are we ready for the next life um, when we get to the other side? That would be my intuition um, at the moment anyway. Well, certainly um, other traditions also think that in this life we're preparing for the next. I mean, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is about, you know, how you go when you die, you go through these bardo states and a lot of 
Tibetan dream yoga, lucid dreaming, the practice of lucid dreaming, you know, meditative practices are about knowing what to do when you die, so you're not completely confused, so you can go through that realm, which is an intermediate realm. Um, so yes, there's, there's this sense of preparing and knowing what to do uh, when you die, which is very important. I think a lot of traditional Christian practice involves trusting for the guidance of Christ when we die as, as our ultimate guide. And in the Hail Mary prayer, you know, pray for us now and at the hour of our death, being the bottom line, the idea that the prayers of Mary can help to mediate this death process. So she's like a midwife of our dying. Um, but I, the ascension thing, you see, I, I actually quite like the idea of ascending uh, because it then, I think of it more like evaporating, actually. Um, it, it's as if Jesus's appearance of his resurrection body evaporated. And that means that it's potentially present everywhere. Um, when you have a body, it's located in one place. But if it is, is ascended into the heavens or ceases to be a, a body in the normal form, then it's presumably present everywhere. And that's how even the most naive conception of Jesus must be, because people pray to Jesus all over the world. And if Jesus can be present to people praying in Nigeria or Australia or Brazil and in England, um, then he must be at least delocalized. Or um, And so actually you get the same with the cult of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary where she's supposed to have undergone an ascension into heaven and, as it were, evaporated. And I see that as a way of putting Mary back in the archetype of the great sky goddess. She becomes the womb from which all the heavenly bodies come forth, a bit like the Egyptian goddess Nut, the sky goddess who gives birth to the planets and the heavenly bodies. So, and the Blessed Virgin Mary is often portrayed as having a blue robe covered with stars. Um, I think this cosmic dimension is important because otherwise we get too focused simply on the earth. And in fact, that's something that St. Paul, with all this talk of archons and powers and principalities, which are really about celestial angels um, um, bringing in this cosmic dimension, they see it as fallen, but when we see it as transformed, um, then we can see it as a, a channel of grace and vision and um, divine presence. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and Bentley Hart, he's very clear that we need this cosmic element, not just the metaphysical reflection on these things. You know, he's very good at the metaphysical reflection, um, meditating on the nature of words like being and using that as a mode of expanding your consciousness and awareness of reality. And there's, there's huge value in that. But he, he, he says very clearly in this that um, to re-enchant or to gain a re-enchanted perception of reality, which is what is really the antidote to the machine mentality, um, is so crucial, um, is to start to re-engage with these myths and stories and accounts. Um, I mean, he's quite keen on fairies himself, all the traditions around fairies, um, the little people, and um, entertaining them again and just sort of seeing where they lead you. Um, not to take things literally, that's again, I think precisely the wrong approach. It's, it's to take these things imaginatively and see what shows up as you let yourself be open to these stories. Um, I think he's He's, not, he's, he's marginally influenced by the idea that our consciousness evolves. Um, he does talk about figures like Owen Barfield, who I'm so keen on every so often. Um, and so the idea that we need to move into a new consciousness that's a, a revivification of the old consciousness, I think is one that he would, would buy and that the romantic movement broadly conceived um, is, is crucial there. He, he ends, I think, the last of his... Um, essays on Gnosticism by saying we need a kind of new romanticism um, and, 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 that, and that's why the Gnostic impulse now does make sense if it's wrong to call the person who wants to upload themselves onto a machine Gnostic there is something 
true about the Gnostic impulse now, which is this sense of feeling trapped and yearning, longing for a kind of escape. I think he, he argues that that's gonna become more and more powerful actually, the more people become aware that mammon and the machine have gripped us. Um, and it's good to follow that Gnostic impulse, not to condemn the world, but precisely to um, be part and parcel of the, the redemption of the world. And by seeing its vitality, how it's suffused with intelligence and life and so on, and finding ways of trying to talk about that and live that and explore that um, in the ways that particularly the Romantics have done. So it's quite a calling to address our situation now as much as a hope for what might be to come. Yes, that puts it really well, Mark. I, I, I think um, one of the things that traps us is not just the machines that actually do dominate our lives, but the idea of the machine, the idea that we're machines, in other words, the mechanistic philosophy of nature, um, which has dominated science since the 17th century and is still the basis of the official worldview of educated people. Um, the idea that our minds are just machines, so that our brains are computers, that our, our whole conscious being is trapped inside our bodies. Um, all of these things he's talking about, the sense of living nature, our connection with it, the um, other beings, in, like his interest in the little people and so on. Um, this more living world he's talking about, um, we can only enter it when we realize that our consciousness isn't trapped inside our skulls, that we're not confined uh, to the limits imposed on our being by this machine philosophy of nature. Um, because it, if you take it seriously, it means your whole consciousness is just inside your head. And you may still be able to have archetypes and psychological um, patterns, uh, but they're nothing but activities of the brain inside the head. They don't correspond to anything out there. They only correspond to things inside other people's heads. Um, and so part of what he's doing, I think, is helping to liberate us from this very narrow view of ourselves and our conscious life that um, we've been imbued with by a mechanistic education. Um, and I think a great deal about the modern world is escaping from that view. It's just that he goes further and thinks in terms of a, a bigger picture than most other, other philosophers, which is one of the reasons I find him so interesting. Yeah, and again, I, I imagine that's quite heavily influenced by Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, and, for example, the liturgy, I think, much more explicitly has this cosmic element in Eastern Orthodoxy. I mean, if you just go into an Orthodox church and see all the icons, you immediately feel like you're in a cosmological representation of things with all the gold and the light and the faces and the figures and angels as well as saints and so on. Um, so rather than just it being about me and my redemption, um, it is about a whole story. Um, which, of course, he's very clear is ultimately a good story. It's a, it's, a, it's a comedy, not a tragedy, the cosmic story, because he's also argued very clearly that um, all will be saved. He thinks that's very clearly the Christian image. Um, so the question is not whether, but how. And whilst it can be very distressing to wonder about the how, it's also very fascinating and, and gives a lot of meaning and purpose, I think, to life when you, as you say, allow your mind to expand and not just be trapped by the machine mentality. Very good, Mark. Well, thank you for these reflections. I, I think time's up, and, um, but that certainly makes it easier for me to assimilate what I've been reading about and thinking about in the last few weeks. Um, and I hope we'll carry this further when we look at the great cosmological picture that you present through your work on Dante's Divine Comedy, which I'm reading at the moment, and which I'm much looking forward to discussing with you in one of our future discussions. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, I'd be very happy to talk about that, of course. Um, and just to say, we'll put the links to David Bentley Hart's discussions of Gnosticism in the notes below. So do have a read of them. There's a lot of fascinating detail as well as getting a direct feel for what he's saying which is immensely valuable so thanks Rupert yeah thank you Mark